Well, we are delighted to welcome a creative powerhouse to the Big AZ. He is a drummer, composer, producer, scholar, and award-winning author with a brand new book. It is called The Singing Earth. Mr. Barrett Martin. Hi. Hello. Hi, Nancy. This is you. I don't know if we can get a good shot of this, yes, but this it is, is you on the front. Can you actually hit that pose? Um, not quite. Okay. <laughs> um, so before diving into the book, um, I want to touch on your musical pedigree because sure. it's it's pretty big. Um, so most people know of you as a rock drummer. Yes. Um, Skin Yard yep. kind of started in, in mid '80s into the '90s. Screaming Trees, which is a beloved grunge era band. Yep. Um, Mad Season, right? Yes. Mid '90s. Yep. I always think of that as a super group. It was. Kind of, a, yeah, that was know? the first real super group that I was in. Yeah, Lane Staley and yeah. um, McCready of, of the Pearl Jam, as I like yes. to say. The um, Pearl Jam. The Pearl Jam. Yeah. And then, of course, Two Atars going strong yep. and Walking Papers. You got a new record coming out. Yeah. Uh, there's a quote that I read that you um, is attributed to you. Yep. Um, it's about being influenced by Muhammad Ali. So I'm going to yes. read this, okay? Yep. Ali was so incredibly fast on his feet, and his hands were both light and heavy at the same time. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. That's the way a great drummer should play, light and heavy, the way Ali boxed. Which really does describe you. How do you play light and heavy? Uh, okay, so when I was a kid, growing up in the 70s, Muhammad Ali was one of my childhood heroes. He had this incredible lightness on his feet, even though he was a heavyweight. Um, and he and he had that backwards dance yes. prance thing, and, yeah. but then he would come in and just had those walloping punches. There's the left, there's the right, perfect combination. And so, as a little kid playing drums, at it's some point no watching Muhammad Ali on TV with Howard Cosell, of course, of course. His, which was his of his course, sparring his favorite friend. Yeah. Um, Watching Muhammad Ali kind of, I started thinking about that as a drummer, uh -huh. and then as I got older, I really appreciated it. Mm -hmm. When you look at the great drummers, like every, everybody from Elvin Jones to John Bonham, mm -hmm. they have this incredible lightness and delicacy in their playing um, when, when they need to. Right. But then they can also just lay into it and it's like a thunderclap. Yes. And, and it's kind of like Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. dancing in the ring and then throwing and a that, punch. And you do, that's, that is how you are. Yeah, You're I, tight and incredibly powerful same time. Thank you. So the new book, uh, The Singing Earth, um, it, it, it captures your musical adventures um, yeah. over a 25 plus years, a lot of history, a lot of environmentalism, music of course. I kind of read it as, a, as your philosophical take on music as the great connector. Yeah. Um, how do you describe the book? Well the book was about seven years in the making. Mm -hmm. I started by Re revisiting my travel journals. And I started to see this connection between the traveling that I had done, the music I was researching, and the change in our global environment. Mm -hmm. And I saw a lot of this up close and personal, um, literally from going to the Amazon rainforest three different times and the Arctic um, and various other uh, delicate ecological regions around the planet. And also in those places, I found incredible music. Yeah. And that music is usually expressed through the environment. Mm. So when you look at the Seattle music scene in the late 1980s, early 90s, it sounded like what Seattle was, was like. You remember. Through. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it was a gritty working class town that was kind of bohemian and had all these artists. Mm -hmm. And the music became an expression of that. In the same way, when I was doing uh, my master's degree field work in the Peruvian Amazon, the music of the Shipibo shamans is a direct reflection of the Amazon rainforest. You mentioned that your first trip to Australia and, and New Zealand in 1991, yeah. that was why you decided to write the book, that first, that first trip in right. 1991. Right. What was significant about that trip? What happened that time? Well, in about 1990, my mom and dad moved to Australia because my dad was in the mining industry, and mm -hmm. that's kind of the world center of mining is right. Australia. So uh, I went down there to visit my dad, and he took me out into the outback, way to the center of Australia where the big giant red rocks are, mm -hmm. uh, what is called Uluru. And we went out with a Aboriginal man from the Pitanjara tribe, and he started singing a song line that was about the landscape we were looking at. Mm -hmm. And then he explained that he was singing out the features of the land. 
You can see rocks in the distance and distant forests and uh, and just the colors of the landscape. And was this a brand new thing for you? you had yeah, never yeah. This I mean, I guess I, I knew that music was about environmental stories, sure. but I hadn't been in a place where the people were actually singing out the landscape. That direct connection. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then later I studied intensely what song lines were. And so that changed, you decided it changed your approach to music. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Up to that point I was playing essentially punk rock. Yeah. You know. Nothing you, wrong with that. No, I love mm -hmm. punk rock, but it wasn't the same thing as this direct connection yes. to the earth. And that kind of flew, flew yeah. the switch. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, lots of uh, amazing stories, including one which we're not going to go into, which is your dad being trapped in a cave right. by a fleeing mass of cobras. That's right. Running from, or they were fleeing from a fire. In, a forest fire in, in Borneo. In, in yes, okay. and yeah. That's page forty-two. It, it's so frightening, but <laughs> we're not going to go into it. Snakes scare me. Okay, so in 1997, you traveled to Belize, Central America, yeah. where you, and this is a quote from you, learned more in a two-week period than in the previous decade of professional music. Yes. That's a huge statement. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, sitting with these, these Garifuna drummers in Hopkins Village, Belize, and they're talking about drumming as a spiritual mechanism, mm -hmm. as a way to literally communicate with ancestors, to touch the spirit world. Drumming is used as a way to communicate sometimes the most sacred information. Mm -hmm. In other words, it would be considered profane to speak it, but you could play the rhythm. It's almost like a prayer. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so it really changed how I thought about drumming as a spiritual vehicle mm -hmm. and as a way to be connected to my community, my culture. And then it was just up to me to figure out how I was going to interpret that. Right. You have an affinity, obviously, for the blues. Yes. Um, yeah. And you write that your trips to the Mississippi Delta uh, to work yeah. with master blues musicians, quote, altered my views of music and the cultural fabric of the United States. Yes. How yeah. so? OK. <laughs> So with American popular music, everything from jazz to rock and roll, R&B, soul, hip hop, country, country blues, all of it comes from the Delta Blues, mm -hmm. which originally came with the slaves from West Africa, manifested in the Deep South, and then became its own thing. So when you play the blues, you're playing America's music. And when you work, like working with C. Dale Davis, yes. he's 91 years old. So when you get to work with someone like that, or, or like Ironing Board Sam, who's more of an R&B singer, but he's 82 or 83 years old. Mm -hmm. When you work with people like that and you hear them tell their stories and you work with them in the place that they grew up and, and hear the things they've experienced, you feel deeply connected mm -hmm. and you realize that you're an American, they're an American, we come from different parts of the country, but we're really united yes. through the music. Yeah. That's and the food. And the, oh, the food. Yes, oh yeah. The, it all does come yeah. together, doesn't yeah. it? It, there's yeah. a, it? Everything dovetails. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations on the book. It's, it's terrific. I have, I have read the whole thing from front to back. It's wow. very good. Uh, the Singing Earth is available, uh, sunyatabooks.com or other places, but I'm going to push it on the Sunyata. And it comes with a CD in the back. And That's right. there's a bunch of uh, some unreleased uh, tracks. Yes. That, yeah, that, so it's a, like, a little surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I thought we could finish um, with a little drumming fun. Okay. And um, so I'm going to name a famous drummer. Okay. Okay. And then you verbally do one of their best riffs or riffs that you think. Okay. Of, okay? okay. So John Bonham, Led Zeppelin. Huge influence on me. And you know, I got to play with Jimmy Page a couple of years ago. That's so. cool. Okay. So I'm just going to do When the Levee Breaks. Good. Okay. Okay. Goo, <laughs> Cuckoo. Nice. Cuckoo. Which is an old That's beautiful. Delta Blue song. Yeah, that right. they See, redid. it's all connected. Yeah. Okay, Keith Moon the Who. I knew you were gonna ask me that. Um, Keith Moon's a tough one because he's all over the map. Yeah, <laughs> he's a wild child. But I'm gonna do Won't Get Fooled Again. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, how about Ringo Starr? Yes, you? huge influence because Ringo was so tasteful. Mm -hmm. You know, he, yes. The cool thing yes. about Ringo Simple, is, but t yes, he played drums like a musical component. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it wasn't just a beat; it was a part. So 
come together. Okay. 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 That's perfect, and I hear the song. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Max Roach, a great jazz drummer. Ah, Max Roach. Okay, what I love about Max Roach was he had this way of playing that was, it was uh, explosive and sometimes arrhythmic. Mm -hmm. So it's more like emotional playing. So there, there's, uh, there's an album that he did with Buddy Rich where they play off each other and, and Max Roach's playing was like, like soul, pure yes. soul, yes. like that. And Buddy Rich would you be all, so was very, <laughs> you know, he was, Buddy Rich was all about the snare drum, and so he was like, Awesome. Let's, let's end it with a Stuart Copeland, the police. Okay. Um, Great drum. I like Stuart Copeland a lot. So, how about Walking on the Moon? Let's do it. Do, do, do. That's my first beatboxing except when I do it in private, so. <laughs> You're very good. You're very good, right, everybody? Yes, 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 indeed. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. That was awesome. Thank that was you. awesome. Thank wow. you.